Today, I am with Michelle Manyard from Carbon Group. Thank you, Carmen. Um, I was just going to say thank you, Car Carmen. Thank you, Michelle, for joining me. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now, you tell me about your position just for the investors that are listening today. What is your position? Yeah, so I'm a partner at the Carbon Group. We're in a tax and accounting firm predominantly. So I'm a chartered accountant, chartered tax advisor. Um, so my job is to basically help investors and anybody that needs to look after their tax obligations navigate that whole path. Excellent. And there is, obviously, we're talking about investors. We're talking about investors that are actually just purchasing their first home. So just so you know who the target audience is, they are quite green to what they can purchase but or what they can claim as a tax deduction. But my first question, and I see this coming up a lot and it's going to be really great for everyone to hear, is investment advisory fees. So for example, a lot of my clients that are listening today um, have paid for a course from an investment advisory company to help them purchase an investment property. And then they also pay me fees to actually do property profiling on their behalf to avoid them flying over and I can do that for them. Are those items tax deductible? Sure. So this is a it depends answer. And what with any tax deduction, it has to be linked to an income producing purpose. So if you were to do the course last year, last financial year, and not purchase a property and have income from a rental property until next financial year, then no, that, that fee wouldn't be deductible because it doesn't relate to something in that financial year that is income producing. However, if they were to happen in the same financial year and you started earning an income from that course or, or the property profiling, I would say there would be more of a nexus to be able to claim that deduction. If you don't get the deduction, though, it doesn't mean it's completely lost. Um, we could possibly say that it was capital in nature, which means you add it to the cost base of the property you're buying. So if and when you sell it in the future, it gets taken into that calculation. So not all is lost. Excellent. People are going to love that answer. So that's really great. <laughs> um, now, can we go to the basics? Like what as, uh, you know, we've purchased an investment property. What can we claim as a tax deduction? Sure. So I really want everyone to know that the ATO is looking and have come out and said that they are targeting rental property investors. So we need to make sure that we get it right. So the, the normal day-to-day, -day, everyday things that you can claim when you have a rental property are the costs you incur, incur for having it. So interest on the mortgage is only the interest, not the principal repayment. Council rates, water rates, property management fees, insurances, repairs and maintenance, all those sorts of things. For people buying a first-time rental property, though, there are a couple of things that you need to know. If you buy a rental property and you are fixing something that was in existence when you bought it, that is not a deduction that you can claim as a repair and maintenance. It needs to be a capital improvement. And so that gets um, claimed over several years and you need to get a depreciation report to pick that up. So that's a big thing I see for property investors is that they do it. They think, well, I'll stick a tenant in there and then everything up from that point on is a repair. It's not. If you bought the house and it had a dated kitchen and then you fix that, that's an improvement, not a repair. So I've got one at the moment where it's a, a gutter and the gutters need to be replaced um, because they're falling off the house and a client is interested in buying that property. So if, I've said to him, if he buys the property, he has to get those gutters replaced. So does it depend on the price that you can deduct versus depreciate? No, no, it doesn't. So in that case, if they're buying a property and the property has something that needs to be fixed, that's what we call an, imp an improvement, not a repair. So they do get the deduction, but the difference between the two is a repair is something that is worn or torn while you have it as a rental property. And therefore you get to claim that deduction outright in the year that you spend the money. An improvement, you still get to claim the deduction, but it happens over several years rather than all up front in one. So again, you don't lose the deduction. You just don't get it all at the same time. So in that case, if they're looking at a property and there is something that needs to be fixed, either before it can become a rental or very, very you know, in the first three, six, 12 months of having that rental property, that's not a repair that's happened as a as a consequence of being a rental. It's something that you're improving and therefore you have to write it off over several years. That's super interesting because the, um, like, just speaking honestly, like I wouldn't want clients not to do things 
for the first 12 months either, um, you know, potentially. So I um, I would, yeah, it, I guess it's just something just to keep in mind because you, there's also times where these works that you're getting done and if I say to you, you need to do these things prior to renting the property out, they are also going to allow you, uh, let's put aside the whole tax deduction thing, they are also going to uh, potentially increase the capital value of your home so you could purchase another one, or it's actually going to bring you in a better rent return. So don't, I guess what I'm saying is don't stress too much and say, I'm not doing any maintenance right. for 12 months because there is other benefits for you doing it. But if it's definitely something non-urgent, like I think when I look at properties, I would like to tell people, I like to buy, I like to purchase properties for people that the property is great. You can rent out as is, has about five years life in it. But then I like just to tell the client, listen, in about three to five years, you probably are going to need to improve the kitchen or the bathroom, et cetera, as well. So ideally having something that is pretty good and ready to uh, rent out straight away without maintenance is the ideal investment in this situation. Of course. And, and, and a key thing here that I speak to a lot of my investment clients about is you don't buy a rental property wanting it for the tax deductions or wanting it to be negatively geared. And, and everyone thinks that negatively geared rental properties are the bomb and that's what you should be looking for. And I always give this example to people, which kind of clears it up. I say to them, there is a hundred dollars on the table and we have two options. The first option is you're going to give me that hundred dollars and I'm going to give you $30 back for the transaction. Alternatively, you can keep the hundred dollars but you have to pay me $30 for the transaction. Which one do you want? And every time they go, oh, the second one, because I get $70 in my pocket. And I'm like, fantastic. The first option is a negatively geared rental property. You are paying $100 to get $30 back. The second one is a positively geared rental property. You're, you're getting to keep $100, or well, you're getting $100, but you have to pay $30 for that. But you're better off in terms of your overall cash flow. So as a, a first-time property investor, you want a property that supports itself. You want one that is positively geared. or, or you know, and, and obviously within your um, property portfolio, there are places for negatively geared properties. But don't buy something or don't look at something going, I can get a tax deduction for this. I can, you know, doing it from a tax deduction perspective is not what you should be doing if, in the overall growth of your property portfolio. Yeah, that was a good reminder for me because I'm still very old school and stuck on that whole, I need to buy an investment for tax benefits and mm. it's a really old school mentality that, that I have as well. So, um, so I get it, but I like that. I'm going to remember that analogy actually every time I think that. Um, and so they definitely have their place. And I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a negatively geared one, but don't go into this thinking I'm going to save on tax because the tax you do get back or you save you're paying for out of your own pocket. Yeah, yeah, not perfect. So what are we seeing? So when the ATO is doing a crackdown, what are they actually seeing? Are they what where are they seeing people taking advantage of the system? Sure. So what they're seeing is people claiming personal things through their rental property. And there's a couple of main areas. So how you structure your loan when you buy an investment property is incredibly important and has implications for your tax deductibility going forward. So what they're seeing is people refinancing the family home possibly to pull down, say, a deposit for their, their um, rental property, but then also borrowing extra to do some renovations on their main house or go on a holiday or do something else. And then if because that loan is attached to their investment property, they're claiming 100% of the interest in that. And it's not. If you don't, all you can claim for when you're claiming an interest deduction is what relates to the purchase price of the rental property. So if you borrowed $400,000, $300,000 was for a rental, but $100,000 you used for your main residence or for other things, you have to apportion the interest. You can only claim interest on the $300,000, even though it's secured over your rental property. Now, a key tip here, which is a really anomaly in the way the ATO looks at things, and, and take this to your mortgage brokers, the difference between a redraw and an offset with your rental property. If you have a rental property that has an offset and you have money sitting in there, obviously you're going to pay less interest. But when you pull that money out of the offset and use it for whatever purpose, including private ones, when the interest goes back up, as long as it's still secured over your rental property and still relates only to the purchase price of your rental, 100% of that interest is deductible. However, if you have a redraw facility on your investment property and you pay extra on your rental property mortgage 
and then pull that back out to use for a private purpose, the ATO says, well, hang on a minute, now that loan is tainted and you can't claim 100% of the interest. Even though the interest amounts are exactly the same from an offset to a redraw, your tax deductibility is different. So keep things incredibly clean and separate if you can. If you have to refinance your family home to borrow, say, a deposit to get your first rental property, get your mortgage broker to structure that part of the loan separate to your refinance that you do on your main property just to keep it really clean. So that's the first thing the ATO is targeting. Secondly is repairs and maintenance. Going to Bunnings if you're doing things yourselves and possibly putting things through that are on your main home, on um, on the rental property, things like that. Um, and it's they, they have a real trick, which I think is so incredibly bold and brazen. In your tax return, there is a box in the rental property schedule which says travel expenses. Um, so claiming travel expenses to go and check on your rental property or to drive by and have a look, they were outlawed about four or five years ago, but they've left the box in the schedule just so people put a claim in there and then trip them up on that. Ah, because that was going to be my next question because I I remember you used to be able to and I didn't think you could do it anymore. So you can, no. um, and, and given that we we're dealing with interstate investors, you can't come over and you can't. So, so, so if you, obviously you can, you, you're able to fly over and check on your rental property, but you don't get a tax deduction for checking on it at all anymore. Yeah, okay. That's good because... Of it. So do you, have they kept that as a bit of a trip up or have they just been too lazy to take it off? I think they've just been too lazy to take it out, but it's really interesting. So what I'm seeing a lot now from the ATO is your, when you load your tax return, it's a self-assessed system. So you put it in, the ATO has two years to check what you put in and then come back and ask you questions and audit you. So just because you get a notice of assessment doesn't mean the ATO has ticked it off to say your return is correct. They've accepted it, but they've got two years to come back. But we're actually seeing a lot more correspondence from the ATO saying, you might want to check that rental property deduction. We're going to have a look at it. Is there anything you want to tell us about? And, and a lot of them is about newly purchased properties because if you you have to put the date you purchased the property in their system, uh, in the return, and then if you've got, say, a big repairs and maintenance claim that year, they're going to say, well, hang on a minute, that's just newly bought. What is all these repairs? And ask you for information. So the other thing that they do is they look at the postcode of where you live. You know, what kind of houses are there? They look at the market rent to see whether you know, you're charging market rent, all these sorts of things, they're getting data and analyzing it. So we're seeing a lot more, please explain. So what you need to do is keep your records, records for five years of money that you've spent and not just bank statements. It needs to be the actual receipt. You don't have to keep a, pop, a paper copy of it. An electronic copy is fine, but you need to have that and hold it for five years. And so what people can also do, like I know that we've got some clients that do it as a property manager, we pay for a lot of their items, but if they've paid their own council rates or something like that because they've put it on their, their credit card, they still send me a copy of it to put it on their file and on their owner portal. Amazing. So all this stuff is in one spot. So that would be something that could be helpful for landlords that, um, that have a property oh. manager. Yeah, just ask them to store it for you. Absolutely. So yeah, talking, that would be perfect. So with all the like the um like the targeting and you know we're talking about the um you know the bunnings receipts and things like that, I would say that if your property was managed by a property manager and you had all of those things, that that to me would be a bit of a red flag. So would it be safe to say that privately managed landlords are the ones that they're noticing this happening with? Yeah, absolutely, because yes. they're the ones that have more expenses that they control. Obviously, things that are property managed, it's it's all above board because someone separate is doing it. For for profit for privately, sorry, for property managed properties, it's more things like the interest and getting the interest right on the mortgage because that's something that the owner controls. Everything else in terms of you know rent repairs and maintenance or you know gardening or pest control or all the things that I think of that people try and give me receipts for that have a different address on to the actual rental property um those things would disappear if it's pro if it's managed by a property manager yeah yeah absolutely so that is um that is a reason why you should have a property manager look after your property because it can help from that point of view um okay well I mean I think that that that's actually quite a bit of a brain overload for me and I feel like just about property managers 
should be listening to this video as well to help understand um, understand those processes and things that are being targeted for. Um, because I I do think that there's I see a lot of people taking advantage um, of the system as well. Like it definitely does happen. Um, I do feel like I've got a lot of clients that are actually most of my clients are very um, very squeaky clean. You know, ready to do the right thing mm. there, which I think is good. But where I think this is going to be a bit of a game changer is really just keeping in mind um, the the tax deductions when you first buy the property. I think that that's the biggest thing that I, I want people to get out of this. Um, now, my final question for you, because it's another question I just remembered does get asked on the group forum, is buying a present. Now, I don't, I don't laugh when I say this, buying a present for your property manager, because they people do buy presents all the time. For the property manager, for the tenant at Christmas time, can that be claimed as a tax deduction? No, is the short answer because it's a choice. It's not. It's not a necessity. So um, the, the ATO says that it needs to be necessarily incurred. It's lovely, and I completely encourage people to do it because having a great relationship with your property manager and your tenant is very important. But no, I wouldn't say that that's something that you could claim tax deduction for. Okay, great. Um, actually, I just thought of one more question. Um, I have a property that is not me personally. I've got a client who's got a property and they rent it out to a family member, to a grandchild, mm. for quite a cheap rent. Is there a rule with that? Mm -hmm. There is. Um, it's called, so basically... What you do, um, if you're not charging market rent, so say in this instance, they're charging 25% of what market rent is, that means they can only claim 25% of their expenses. So what you need to do in that case is you need to, what I would do is get a valuation from a property manager to say the, the, the market rent on this property would be $500 per week. And then if they choose to only um, charge half of that, then they can only claim half of their expenses. Again, the expenses they don't claim or they're not eligible to claim in their tax return that year, um, they get to add them to the cost base of the property. So if and when they do sell it, that they can affect the, the cost base that way. But you don't get 100% of the expenses if you only get 50% um, of the rent. Yeah, perfect. Because I get, I guess it's going to be people out there that say, "Oh, I'll just charge my my kids fifty dollars a week." Mm -hmm. Then I've got it as a tax yeah. deduction, so you can't do that. And and that's what the ATO will pick up. They will look at what you charge. Like they ask you questions like, "How many weeks was it rented?" And then they obviously ask for your total rent for the year. And if that's not market, like that's another one, a question that will get flagged about. Well, hang on a minute. Why are you not charging market rent, but you're claiming a hundred percent of the expenses? So, um, yeah, they will look at all of those things. Yeah, and I think they're all very very fair things. So I don't think um oh. they're reasonable at all. So. It's good to get a refresher and a reminder on that. Michelle, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and um, and sharing that because it's really, really important information that people need to self-educate themselves on and, um, and, and um, yeah, basically self-educate yourself as an investor um, and making sure that you're doing the right thing because ultimately you're the one that is fully responsible. So um, it's really great for them to hear. Thank you very, very much. My pleasure.